I am pleased and honored to give the floor to Ambassador John Negroponte, uh, Vice Chairman McClarty Associates, former U.S. Director of National Intelligence and former Deputy Secretary of State. Ambassador Negroponte, please. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Kurtz, I appreciate the, the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, appear before you uh, today at this uh, very important conference uh, organized by uh, the INSS. And uh, also uh, want to thank uh, General Yadlin for having uh, taken the initiative to uh, extend the original invitation to me. Uh, to come here uh, today. Uh, General Yadlin and I had the opportunity to work very closely together uh, when uh, I was Director of National Intelligence and he was uh, Director of Israeli Military Intelligence. And I, I think it's fair to say that we had uh, a very good relationship, uh, spent many hours, even days, uh, together uh, dealing with uh, very important questions many long conversations, uh, both, uh, both here in Israel and uh, back uh, in Washington. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be here and to uh, visit with you again in uh, your new incarnation. Um, I, I don't think I have uh, 15 minutes worth of commentary at, at this point, so maybe I'll give some of the time back to the conference organizers, and then we maybe have a little more chance for uh, questions and answers and further commentary. First, I do want to make uh, a comment about Iran, since I won't have a, another opportunity to do that. And I thought that, uh, given the fact that, uh, particularly when I was director of national intelligence, I had an opportunity to devote a fair amount of time to that issue. I, I, th there was one comment that I would like to make which I think uh, feeds into discussion that we may have later. And that is that uh, shortly after becoming the Director of National Intelligence in April of 2005, in fact, several weeks after, we published a national intelligence estimate. I think it was in May of 2005, which had the following uh, principal conclusion, and this is almost uh, a direct quote, it said that uh, in our judgment, Iran was determined to acquire a nuclear weapon, and that uh, uh, according to our best estimate, the likely time frame in which it would uh, acquire such a weapon was sometime between the years 2010 and 2015. Now, that was our assessment in May of 2005. Um, obviously, I'm no longer in government, so I don't have the day-to-day -day access to information that I used to have. But based on uh, what I know and my reading of the press and listening to some of the commentary that's made on these subjects, uh, I don't think that that fundamental assessment that we made back in May of 2005 uh, has really changed. Maybe the timing, obviously, 2010 has already come and gone, but uh, so there may be some nuances here. But in terms of Iran's intentions, I think uh, they are very much on the same path the, that we judge them to be uh, seven years ago. And I think as we develop strategies and think about how to react to this situation, we have to bear uh, that judgment in mind. At least that is my opinion. Now on the question of uh, the so-called Arab Spring, first let me say I, I think Mr. Heller's paper is very good. Thank you very much for that. I think it's excellent. I, uh, I've read it uh, several times and uh, I, I find uh, very little to, uh, to debate in terms of your principal conclusions and I think uh, one of them clearly is that situations vary, 
uh, according to uh, history, circumstances, geography, and that uh, there are no foregone conclusions in this, in this business. And secondly, um, a lot depends on how external actors uh, react to a particular situation so that the, the, the initial political dynamic may well be internal, but then uh, quite a bit can depend on uh, how the outside actors uh, react, especially in the case uh, where there are relatively, relatively speaking, uh, weak regimes and they have no powerful external defenders. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, in Eastern Europe uh, during the Cold War, there was a lot of desire for political change over a very long period of time. You can go all the way back to the 1950s and there were uprisings that took place. And uh, we even favored enhanced political freedom for these countries, but as it turned out, uh, we realized there wasn't much we could do about it so long as the Soviet Union was prepared to enforce its political uh, doctrine in that part of the world. And it really is only when those inherent conditions surfaced again in the 19. 80s and early 1990s and the Soviet Union happened to have a leader <laughs> that decided not to enforce the Brezhnev doctrine and the Stalin doctrine and the, all the doctrines that they'd been carrying out for the previous 75 years that uh, Eastern Europe found its, found its freedom. So that was a happy outcome even though it was awfully long time uh, in coming. It was certainly uh, since the period of World War Two. Now, I just, before uh, commenting on the current situation, I do want to revert back to history just a little bit because, as one of my colleagues, Tom Pickering, uh, said to me at a conference uh, uh, recently, one of my former colleagues, and of course, of, uh, an, uh, an illustrious ambassador and a former ambassador to uh, the State of Israel, he once commented, we don't do regime change very well. So uh, uh, when you, Mr. Heller, Dr. Heller talked about modesty, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think we have to be uh, uh, careful in our commentaries and in our prognostications because we're dealing with a, an area that uh, is very uh, hard to predict uh, and, and not that easy to know, uh, know about. But, uh, what I do uh, want to recall uh, from the point of view of history is how often uh, we have, at least speaking from an American point of view, favored regime change uh, and then subsequently uh, come in one way or another to regret the results. And uh, it's almost, to me, uh, from, from, the, from my point of view, I, if I could look back at my career, I just see so many examples of that that I have worked with, lived with, and uh, as I said, come to regret. My first experience with this was the overthrow of Ngo Dinh Diem in South Vietnam, who uh, was the president of South Vietnam and was overthrown and, and killed uh, in November of 1963. And I think there are many people today who would argue that that was one of the threshold developments uh, that led to the political chaos in that country and ultimately to the dispatch of some 500,000 United States troops uh, to deal with the uh, situation in South Vietnam. And one can wonder whether history might have turned out differently uh, had it not been <clears throat> for the overthrow of Ngo Dinh Diem. And I don't think there are many people who would argue that the communist government that ultimately uh, came to uh, take over South Vietnam and to rule that country uh, provided a greater deal of political freedom than existed uh, in South Vietnam um, at, at the time of Diem. Uh, another example, and, and, and really this comes down to the question of, and, and I think all of us in democracies have a great deal of difficulty making choices between evils, the lesser of two evils. How do you make that kind of choice? Politicians hate to make that kind of choice. It's uh, very distasteful. So I'm going to raise a distasteful example. General Somoza would uh, 
would Nicaragua really, uh, was it inevitably better off as a result of the overthrow of Somoza or of the Shah uh, of Iran? And look at was, what has happened as a result of the demise uh, of the Shah and the fact that this Iranian revolution has now passed, uh, well past its 30th anniversary and as far as I can tell, uh, hasn't really changed its nature uh, in any significant respect. And it is, what, it is what makes me pessimistic about the prospects uh, for some kind of a negotiated uh, outcome to the nuclear issue with Iran unless, unless we can bring so much diplomatic and economic, particularly economic pressure uh, to bear uh, on Iran that uh, for the sake uh, of, uh, of their own uh, economic survival, uh, they will come to the conclusion that they have no choice but to come to some sort of accommodation with the international community. And of course, we still don't know what history is going to be written about the demise of President uh, Mubarak. Uh, but I must say that when I watched those events unfold from the outside, admittedly, from uh, outside of government, I had a little bit of that uneasy feeling and I raised that uneasy question in my own mind as to whether or not we were seeing sort of a replay of what had happened uh, perhaps in Iran or perhaps in Vietnam or perhaps in some other example in our past history. And of course, we won't know until we see how the situation in Egypt uh, turns out. I've already said I, I certainly agree with general characteristic number one in the working paper. Very few generalizations are universally valid. General consequences, outcomes are inherently unpredictable. Yes, indeed. Um, now, specifically with regard to the Arab Spring, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, if you're talking, uh, looking at the underlying conditions in the Middle East and accepting uh, Israel, of course, uh, other than oil and the export of oil to, to the world, I think that uh, the Middle East economies are, are probably the least integrated economies uh, with the rest uh, of the world. Oh, I only have three minutes. I thought I had 15 minutes. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I have three minutes left. Okay, sorry. All right, well, I will then um, uh, cut back further. Um, so, uh, and, and also in the Middle East, I'd say the least democratic and, uh, and politically free region uh, uh, of the world. Uh, with a few obvious uh, examples outside the region that, uh, uh, such as China or North Korea. But if you contrast develop political developments in Latin America and Africa during the past 25 or 30 years, the degree of uh, movement towards democracy has been, uh, uh, the pace of, of movement towards democracy has been much greater than in this part of the world. Tunisia, I see as having been a kind of a, spontaneous uh, eruption such uh, and the conditions were such that uh, one spark was really enough to change the situation. But the key point uh, I would like to make regards Egypt and if I was going to leave one message with you uh, regarding uh, the Arab Spring, it seems to me that the most critical issue is which uh, way will Egypt go? Will Egypt go uh, the way of the Ayatollahs or will it go towards some kind of a more secular model? And it seems to me that the evolution of Egypt and the, and, and the direction in which Egypt goes is by far the most critical question uh, with regard uh, to the Arab Spring. And it seems to me that the policy implication of this and this was alluded to uh, by some of the points that uh, Dr. Heller made, are that there is a real imperative for uh, countries such as the United States, Israel, the rest of the Arab world, Europe, uh, to 
uh, work very, very closely to help ensure uh, that Egypt is a political, an economic, and a social uh, success. I think that uh, there's a need for major uh, supportive uh, policies such as uh, free trade arrangements. Uh, we were at one point a number of years ago talking about a possible free trade agreement with Egypt and uh, uh, that was uh, put to one side. I think it's really uh, something that we ought to take a, a look at again. Uh, other kinds of trade and investment uh, initiatives would also be important. But it's, it's critical because if Egypt goes in the wrong direction, it seems to me that that will sour the whole atmosphere of the Middle East and complicate uh, our policies and our strategies enormously. Uh, given the uh, fact that I have uh, run out of time, I will simply say with respect to Syria, I think that uh, We've had to be more cautious. We're hearing now more talk about uh, the possibility of some kind of eventual uh, international intervention in response to uh, the humanitarian uh, outrages that have taken place uh, in that country. But at the same time, I think I can understand why our administration and others have been more cautious with regard to Syria, simply in terms of how, pl how full uh, the plate is and the fact that it is very difficult to deal with uh, a multiplicity of these kinds of crises uh, at any one time. And history is replete with examples of governments and administrations that have had to, uh, notwithstanding uh, the fact that a particular objective might be desirable, they have had to sequence their strategy, sequence their approaches, uh, in the interest of, uh, of the uh, sort of intelligent management of their international relations. So I would say in conclusion that uh, stabilizing uh, Egypt, stabilizing and supporting Egypt is the single greatest priority. Supporting democratization in Syria and Iran, but not to the point of uh, direct uh, intervention. We must recognize that our own record on regime change and nation building uh, has been mixed at best. Uh, and finally, I think that uh, we, we've got to recognize that these are generational issues. They will take time uh, they, and they will need strategic patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I, if I may, I think one of the key messages you just uh, conveyed is that uh, you reminded us that we should be uh, careful what we wish for. Thank you for that as well.